Today, I'd like to tell you about the future of medicine and how we can reimagine the ways in which we treat disease by programming biology. But before we get started, let me tell you a bit about how I got here. So the first time I got to play with a computer was at the age of seven. See, my dad was an engineer at IBM at the time, and he built the memory devices that go into your computer. So he'd bring home early PC prototypes, and I'd get to open them up, start digging in, and start programming them. So I continued down this computer programming path until college, when I realized that many of the fundamental ways in which we design and scale computers had already been worked out. And I wanted to find a field where the rules had yet to be determined. So about 15 years ago, I made the switch from programming electrical computers to programming biological computers. And in retrospect, this was a great decision, because it turns out that biological programming has a wide range of applications, because if you haven't guessed, life is everywhere. And so let me give you an example of this. Think about the ways in which we treat diseases. The, the drugs that we have today are essentially unsophisticated. Once you take them and they go into your body, we have very few ways of controlling what they do or where they go. And what excites me most about biological programming is that it no longer has to be this way. We can design smarter and more sophisticated drugs. And we do this by programming the DNA inside of living cells as therapies, using the tools of genome editing and synthetic biology. These two fields go hand in hand with each other. Genome editing tools like CRISPR are like the delete button on your keyboard. It lets you find small errors in your genetic code and fix them. Synthetic biology is like the rest of the keyboard. It allows you to program completely new genetic code from scratch. When I made my switch into synthetic biology, the first biological switches and clocks had just been developed with this technology. We were like little kids playing with our first Legos, just figuring out how they worked and how to put them together. We've made many advances since then. Today, my lab focuses on using synthetic biology to create adaptive diagnostics and adaptive therapies. We call these adaptive because they're designed to go in the body, sense disease, and respond by making the right drug at the right time and the right place. So let me give you an example. Everyone here, I'm sure, is familiar with the RoombaVac, which follows you around, uh, follows around, goes around your house and picks up after you. The reason that RoombaVac can do it is because it's outfitted with computers, ones that are constantly measuring its distance from the wall, computing where it's been, and thinking about where it should go next. If we want living cells to be able to do that in our bodies, we need computers in our cells as well. And so over the last decade, we've started to make progress in enabling those cells to do things like your computer. We now have cells that can calculate math. We have living cells that can compute logic. And we have cells that remember their history. So by putting these components together, we can start creating the diagnostics and the therapies of the future. So for example, Everyone over the age of 50 is supposed to get a yearly colonoscopy to screen for early signs of colon cancer. I don't know about you, but most people don't look forward to that. And so we can reimagine a different strategy. What if you could simply take a pill and have that pill go in your body and tell you whether you have early signs of disease? You'd probably prefer that. So to do that, we engineered probiotic bacteria, similar to the type you probably ate in your yogurt today. We designed these bacteria with a genetic program allowing them to sense early signs of disease like bleeding or inflammation and respond by producing light. And now because you eat these bacteria, they have to come out somewhere. And so when they come out the other end, you can take your stool and you can look at it and see if it's glowing. By looking at it's glowing, you can tell where the bacteria picked up those early signs of disease. Now for most people, looking through their stool is not really their cup of tea. So the next thing we did was to actually design a little pill that served as a house for the bacteria. Inside of that pill, we put an electrical chip one that could convert the light made by the bacteria to a wireless signal. So then now the signal can be transmitted from the inside of your gut to your cell phone. So we first demonstrated that this could work in, in the gut of pigs to detect blood. But pigs don't own cell phones, so we're now trying to make this a reality in humans. So in the future, instead of guessing what's going on inside of your body, we can simply program cells to tell us. Now these advances aren't just limited to diagnostics. We can start doing them for therapeutics as well. Science fiction writers have long imagined little robots that flow in your body looking for signs of disease and trying to fix them. But what if we could do that with cells instead of doing that with mechanical robots? So patients with a disease called phenylketonuria are unable to process a specific amino acid called phenylalanine. To tackle this problem, the same probiotic bacteria I mentioned earlier were designed to go in the gut, switch on specifically in the gut, and degrade phenylalanine for them. The hope is that these bacteria can replace the missing metabolic activity in these patients and allow them to live healthy lives 
by simply consuming a probiotic pill from time to time. And these sort of bacteria are currently in clinical testing. So we've made a lot of progress in engineering bacterial programs. What about human programs? Can we start designing once to tackle more complex diseases like cancer? I'm sure everyone in this room knows how crafty cancer can be and how punishing cancer treatments can be on their patients. If you're lucky and you can see your tumor, then your doctor can either shoot it with toxic radiation or cut it out. But in many cases, cancer finds ways to try to evade detection. Why is it so hard to detect cancer? Think of it this way. Cancer is sort of like a team of spies that are trying to hide out in the general population. If you simply try to look for a single clue to whether this is a cancer or not, you can be very easily mistaken. Instead, if we want to find the imposters living in the population, we have to do some real detective work. We have to maybe sift through their bank accounts, monitor their coming and goings, learn about their habits. And by putting multiple clues together, we can be much more confident at finding the imposters and not affecting uh, the normal population. So treating cancer is similar in theory, but hard to implement in reality. The best cancer drugs we have today target individual cancer signatures. And by doing that, they can distinguish between cancer cells and non-cancer cells. But for many tumors, this is, those individual signatures are hard to find. And even when we find them, cancer finds ways around them. They can evolve and escape. To tackle a complex disease like cancer, we need more sophisticated therapies. So one way we try to tackle this, again, through biological programming, is by designing something called a logic gate. The logic gate we made is called an AND gate. And the way it works is it only turns on in the presence of two cancer signatures instead of one. And so you know that when you detect these two signatures, you can be much more confident that this is a cancer cell and this is not a cancer cell. We designed these biological programs to trigger a very powerful therapeutic program. Number one, killing the cancer cells directly. And number two, recruiting the rest of the immune system into the battle to try to reduce the chance uh, that the tumors could escape. We first demonstrated that this could work in mouse models of ovarian cancer. And we're now trying to make this a reality uh, in humans. Um, when, we, when we first tried this approach, we used viruses to deliver the logic gates into the body. One of the limitations with using viruses, though, is that they don't really circulate very well through the body. And so they may not be suitable for those cases where we have disseminated tumors. Fortunately, we can now build similar logic gates today in human cells, ones that do freely patrol throughout the body and can act as sentinels for disease, querying every cell they come encounter with, are you cancer or are you not, and responding by treating it. And our hope is that a wider range of cancers can be addressed uh, using this sort of approach. So we've made a lot of advances being able to engineer bacteria, viruses, and human cells as therapies. But this is really only starting to scratch the surface. Let me give you three examples of what people are working on today for the therapies of tomorrow. So what if we could design self-regulating therapies, ones that replace the natural feedback mechanisms that you lose during disease? Patients with diabetes have lost the ability to recognize how much blood sugar levels there are and respond by making the right amount of insulin. So these patients have to prick themselves on a constant basis, use a machine to measure their blood sugar levels, calculate uh, how much insulin they should deliver, and then inject themselves. We can now design biological programs that go into living cells and automatically sense blood sugar levels and respond by making the right amount of insulin. What if we could create a wider menu of replacement tissues? As we age, our bodies degenerate, our bones get weaker, our joints fail, and our hearts no longer work. Our strategies for fixing this today are to try to slow down the disease or to replace these with mechanical ones. But what if we could design programs, ones that more efficiently direct stem cells to produce bone, to produce cartilage, to produce hearts, to serve as biological replacements? And what if we could gain deeper insights into why brain diseases like Alzheimer's actually occur? One of the challenges with this currently is we don't have good ways of actually just seeing what's going on up in there. But by designing biological sensors and biological memory, we can gain a better insight into when, why, and how these diseases actually develop, and perhaps develop therapies to try to treat them. There's so much promise ahead, but many technical challenges remain if we're ever going to reach that point. In the beginning, programming biology was really difficult. We had so much we wanted to write, but putting it into reality was a challenge. We had to look for the DNA we wanted somewhere in the world. We had to purify that DNA. We had to cut it out. We had to paste it into the program we were writing. Writing biological programs like this was a little bit like trying to write a Dr. Seuss story, but only being able to cut and paste words from the Wall Street Journal to do it. But today, we have the full keyboard ahead of us. Our raw ability to read DNA and write DNA is accelerating at an exponential pace, in some cases, even faster than computers have developed. And this is going to lead to a democratization and an acceleration of biological programming. High school students today can design their programs, upload it online, and get it in the mail just a few days later. 
Despite this, we are still nowhere near the complexity of the natural biological systems that we're all born with. And one of the fundamental reasons for this is we don't have a deep mathematical understanding of how biology actually operates. This is very different than other fields like physics or mechanical engineering. It's sort of like being asked to assemble IKEA furniture, but doing it in a dark room, without any light, without any instruction manual, and without tools. So we need a couple things. We have to turn on the light. We need an instruction manual that actually makes some sense. And then we need something better than those little tools they give you. So what this means in reality for us is that we need better data gathering technologies, ones that allow us to peer into cells and monitor what every part of our genetic program is doing in real time. This is going to generate vastly more data than humans can process on our own. So we'll need computers, perhaps artificial intelligence, to sift through that data and come up with the instruction manual. And we're going to need constant improvements in our ability to read DNA and write DNA so that this process of designing biology can be faster, cheaper, and easier. If we're able to do that, then perhaps one day we'll be able to program at a higher level, sort of like sketching the outline of a story and letting a computer fill in the rest of the details. Uh, 15 years ago, I made the switch from programming electrical computers to programming biological computers because I felt that we were at the cusp of a revolution. We've made so much progress since then, but much opportunity still lays ahead of us. As with any new field, there will be setbacks, disappointments, and challenges along the way. But I'm confident that as we continue to push forward, we'll ultimately surpass the limitations of our current medicines and finally be able to treat complex human diseases with sophisticated therapies. Thank you.